First of all, I'd like to welcome all of the panelists and, and uh, participants to this webinar about discovery and deposit services for repositories. Um, I won't take up too much time. I'm the Executive Director of CORE, which is the Confederation of Open Access Repositories. And of course, it's very important for us to um, ensure that repositories are part of the formal and informal um, scholarly communication system. And the services that are built on repositories are very important for this. So um, uh, without further ado, I'd like to thank our panelists for agreeing to come and present today. We have three people that are representing different services built for repositories. Um, and we, they will speak for 20 minutes each, and then we will have questions at the end. So um, the plan is to run the webinar for an hour and a half. Uh, so uh, for the first hour, we'll have the presentations, and then uh, you can put your questions at any time into the chat box, and we'll go through your questions at the end of the three presentations. Um, so on that note, I'd like to introduce um, Heather as the first speaker, Heather Pivovar, who is the co-founder co of our research and um, which is the company behind uh, on paywall which I'm sure many of you have heard of so um, with that note I turn it over to Heather Heather you're on mute okay fixed good, Sounds good. good awesome everybody I'm thrilled to be here let me just get my screen sharing going There we go. Can you see my slides? Yes. Awesome. Thanks, Kathleen. Okay, everybody, thrilled to be here. I want to give you a bit of an overview of Unpaywall uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it or might not uh, be up to date on all the things it's up to. So as Kathleen mentioned, I'm from our research. I co-founded it along with Jason Preem. You might have heard of it as an uh, impact story. We are an eight-year-old nonprofit and have uh, changed our path uh, recently. In our research, we feel the name really embodies what we're trying to do as a nonprofit uh, with Unpaywall and other things. So the quick overview I'm gonna give today is inspired by Open Repositories 2019 this last June. Um, I was lucky enough to give a keynote there and so some of what I'm gonna cover um, was from that keynote and the keynote itself was inspired by the rest of the conference so specifically in one of the in the opening keynote um people were talking about how we can't out google google right so the keynote was about how um we want to do build grade infrastructure and um but we don't have the resources of google how can we possibly do anything at that scale and i think there's lots of good points there i'm not uh going to rebut that as an overall you know, message. It is a challenge, but I think we also, um, frankly, we have out Googled Google, where the we here is everybody in this, in, at Open Repositories and in this webinar room together in some really important ways. We out Googled Google. We built something that's made a difference in the world in a way that Google didn't. And so we shouldn't, uh, to borrow from something Peter I'm sure is going to talk about, we shouldn't leave it all to Google, um, but we should look for gaps where Google's not doing things and others aren't doing things and so on and try to fill them because we can really make a big difference. So specifically on paywall, um, when I'm saying it's built on things that all of us have done, it's built on an approach and early code from base, from Disseman, from Open Access Button, and it uses data from Crossref, the Directory of Open Access Journals, PubMed, Europe PMC, and thousands of repositories and their OAI PMH endpoints. Now let me back up for a minute and tell you about what Unpaywall is, for those of you who might not know. So, the, so Unpaywall is a database of links to open access articles. So it's a database of every DOI that Crossref issues. So that's more than 100 million DOIs right now. And then we scour the internet, uh, especially some OAI PMH endpoints, as many as we can get, and publisher websites and so on, to find all the open copies of that research article that we can. 
And then we match them to their DOI, even if they don't have a DOI in the place that we find them. We match them to the DOI and we uh, validate that the link is a valid link. We capture metadata about it. So is it the version of record? Is it a submitted version or accepted version? So on. And we pull all that together in a great big database. So that database is on paywall and it's currently got about 23 million, um, about 23 million Crossref DOIs have open access copies that we've found. Uh, you may be familiar with this image. That's because the Unpaywall database is also used in a browser extension. And the browser extension appears like uh, this little tab that pops up on the side of your screen whenever you're on a paywalled article that we have found an open access copy of somewhere. We pop up on the just subtly on the side of your screen uh, this little icon and turn it a bright friendly green so that you know you can just click right there and go straight to the copy wherever it may be in an institutional repository often in pubmed central uh, or sometimes even on the publisher page as you probably know getting to the pdf link on the publisher page can actually be a little tricky so some people use it just for that Anyway, the unpayable extension has been, this is an old slide, but it um, has more than 200,000 active users around the world. Um, I'm going to skip by that one. And it's also used by um, all of these different tools. So uh, I remember, I'm gonna actually going to go back to that slide because this is talking about Google Scholar actually does this, right? Google, if you search for papers on Google Scholar, it shows you there uh, where you can get copies of the paper in institutional repositories, in Semantic Scholar, and so on. The problem is that Google Scholar does not make that information available for others to build on in their tools. So to use this, you have to be on Google's website. And that means that others can't build on it. What we've done in Unpaywall, we're not only a nonprofit, we really believe in open source, open data, open APIs, being something that people can build on. And so the thing that we've built can be integrated and furthermore has been integrated all in the last two years, maybe two and a half by now to be fair. <laughs> um, and Paywall is integrated into Web of Science. So anytime you see a link to the full text in Web of Science, that data is coming from the Unpaywall database. As is all links in Scopus, Europe PMC, we're supplementing, Dimensions, Lens, you can read this yourself, um, ProQuest and EBSCO, that's in their link resolvers. Capernio, as you know, has a, um, a button. Uh, their data is coming from Unpaywall, open access button that Joe, I think, will talk about, and so on. Um, as well, just right at the bottom there, a lot of libraries use us in their link resolvers. Um, so it, in their link resolver, um, checks to see if they have a holding for the paper. If they don't, before they go to the um, ILL page, they check the unpaywall database uh, to see if we found an open access copy to send to their users instead. So that's some of the integrations that have been possible with and, and are done and actively going today uh, because of Unpaywall, as well as just having that data set means that people can crunch it and do studies and do analytics. So uh, the Open Science Monitor from the EU, uh, various papers, including actually ones that we've written, <laughs> um, university rankings, all sorts of country analyses and many more. The slide's a bit out of date. Anyway, here's our open API. You can see, you'll get these slides later, I think, or I'll, I'll tweet them out. Um, the API is really simple to use. You don't even need to register for an API key. You just need to put your email address there so we can contact you if there's any problems. You can call it 100,000 times a day. Uh, so we, we actually are getting about 2 million calls calls a day uh, as one of the ways to get the access uh, to the data in our database. Um, we've been, I forget why I am doing, I think to show the scope of the integration. So it caught the eye uh, of 
uh, all these integrations caught the eye of reporters and so on. And it really is making a difference. So Web of Science before the unpaywall integration only had full text links, free full text links for 2 million things and after unpaywall. In their catalog, they had 12 million. Similarly, Scopus went from 1.5 million to 7 million. So it's really making you know, a notable difference for, um, for discovery. Europe PMC, so I would have thought that Europe PMC did a great job already of finding open access links, and of course they did, but they weren't getting everything, so they didn't have a good way to get access to everything that was a green OA copy in institutional repository. So by integrating that, you can see over there on the side, sort of halfway down your screen, uh, all the way on the right, it says full text. That might well be linking to your IR <laughs> uh, from your PMC, which is awesome. So, so if we let that sink in, these integrations mean a lot for users of open repositories because you're no longer re reliant on people just finding you via a Google search, search or those nerdy people in your universities who know and like your IR, who know to go search there. But it's unleashed all that power of your repositories into all these other systems. So when you add new content to your repositories, it has the potential to help all those people. Um, this email was one, now frankly, we don't get these all every day. I don't want to mislead you to think that we do, but um, it's really meaningful, you know? People, people really want access and they don't know how to get it. And what we're doing is important. So I put that here because this email came to us. Unpaywall is in some ways the last mile home. People see it as the face of all of this work, but it's really just the last mile home and it couldn't, it was not possible without all of the um, work and advocacy and blood, sweat and tears you do to get all of that content into your repository. So this email uh, is really addressed to you as well. Okay. And it's because, again, we built a great open API based on the shoulders of others' open work and making it available to others. So tech stack, uh, happy to answer more questions about this in the question period if people want to know. Uh, so we're, uh, Jason and I are also developers. Uh, and so we coded all this up and we brought in a third person named Richard, uh, who is the one who will probably be answering any tech questions you've got. Um, but on Paywall itself is built on Python, Flask, SQL Alchemy, Sickle is the library we use to do the OAI PMH importing. Uh, Postgres is our database. Uh, it's hosted on Heroku and MIT license, uh, available on GitHub. Uh, the GitHub repository is called OADOI because uh, that was its name before we came up with the catchy name of Unpaywall. Anyway, the data there is the data, Unpaywall data, we really try to make it openly and freely available to the maximum extent we can while remaining a sustainable nonprofit. And we're pretty, we're pretty happy with how that's going so far. Um, so let me tell you about all of the ways it's open. As I mentioned, there's that open API. Um, that's the top. There's a redirection URL for link resolvers. So if you really put HTTPS, uh, on paywall.org, right, and then slash the DOI, it will automatically redirect uh, to an open copy uh, whenever it's available. There's a CSV download where you can upload uh, 5,000 DOIs at a time and get a, DO, a CSV, uh, a spreadsheet of the open access links. We do a full database dump of all 100 million DOIs and all of the places where we have found open copies for them. We do that every six months. A lot of researchers use that. Um, a lot of research offices use that. A lot of uh, uh, countries to assess their OA policies and so on. As I mentioned, there's the browser extension for Chrome and Firefox. And then finally, we've got one more way, and this is actually a paid way um, to access the unpaywall data and what makes us sustainable. There's a subscription to a weekly update feed and an uptime contract. So some companies like uh, Clarivate Analytics for Web of Science, like Elsevier for Scopus, they don't want to rely on the open API for their product. That's not enough reliability for them. They actually want a contract that says we have um, liability insurance <laughs> and they also want a way to conveniently keep a local copy of the unpaywall database in-house up to date. So for those customers, we offer a weekly diff, a weekly 
like update file of everything that's changed that week, either because there's new papers that were published or new things became OA, or we found new things because of imp improvements or things stopped being OA, or that we got bug. Anyway, lots of reasons why things might have changed. Um, they subscribe to that and get a contract in return for money. And so that's our sustainability model. And we don't actually have very many customers, um, but the ones we have are mostly large. And so that's worked out really well and funded uh, all of this openness for everybody else. And so Unpaywall is currently used by, again, all of these people. And frankly, some of them are customers, are paying customers, and some aren't. So Europe PMC um, uses us just based on the open API, whereas, as I said, Web of Science and Scopus are actually paying customers. OK, so I'm going to be a bit short on time, um, but in question time, feel free to ask me more questions about the history. Um, how did we end up doing this? Uh, tech details about how do we match to things without DOIs. Um, I mentioned very briefly that we do version detection and so on, or sustainability. I'm really happy to talk about any and all of that. Um, and if you want to check if your repository is indexed by Unpaywall, or you find a bug, even on either on your repository overall or a one specific DOI and you think it may be instructive to us to find that, we would love to hear about it. Um, and so this URL right there in the middle is how you can check if we are um, indexing your repository. And then the email address at the bottom, support at unpaywall.org, is how you can reach out to us and talk to Richard about indexing your repository or improving the version detection for your repository, uh, or just simply if you found a, uh, a bug. And I want to quickly mention our, our next big thing, which is based on unpaywall data, um, both because it's a, I think it will be interesting to you um, in, in your universities, and also because it's yet another, I think going to be really game-changing way uh, the unpaywall data and therefore all of your data uh, is going to change scholarly communication. And that's this product, Unpaywall Journals. So here is a screenshot of it. Um, what we're doing is bringing in the subscription. So the reason we built Unpaywall Journals is lots of universities were coming to us saying, hey, have you got unpaywall data grouped by journal? because we want to see what percentage of a given journal is open access because we think that should factor in to our negotiations for renewal. We should, it, either the price or whether we should subscribe at all. And as we started doing that, um, as we started to think about how to meet this need for them, we realized they, they not only want if to solve their, your actual need, we actually want to know the amount of open access for the next five years and the amount that backfile will contribute to access if you were indeed to cancel and so on. So what we've done is built a tool that shows you if you were to unsubscribe from everything and then resubscribe based on cost effectiveness that takes open access into account, what would you subscribe to? How much instant access do you get? And how much would it cost? So that's what Unpaywall Journals is. Um, and as you can see, there's a slider here. This is a GIF. You can actually move. This is a demo based on a large US university and their actual uh, big deal. And so if you imagine subscribing to more and more uh, journals, you can see um, the price go up. But you're starting from a basis with where 13% of this big deal package is open access already. And that makes a big difference uh, to what people subscribe to. Anyway, if you are interested, the URL at the bottom there is a free demo, as I said, based on real data from a real US university. And as a nonprofit, our goal is to get this tool um, to, er, to everybody. So we're doing a really low price point. It's just $1,000 a year per institution. And that is for all, you can analyze any publisher you want with any customized um, stats you want and it's really easy to set up. So again, the, um, happy to talk about that um, offline um, or in the question period a little bit. There's lots more to it uh, than that. It's also really early so we'd absolutely love your feedback on that. And again, I just want to end with the fact that uh, your work and all this data make it possible uh, and we're really grateful. Thanks very much. Oh, thank you very much, Heather. That's really interesting. And 
I, I may use my privilege as a moderator to ask you a first question when the questions come up. Um, but um, uh, on that note, I'd like to introduce our next presenter. He's Dr. Peter Craker, Cracker, um, founder of the and chairman of Open Knowledge Maps. So I'll hand it over to you now, Peter. Thank you very much, Kathleen, and uh, welcome from my side. I'm going to share my presentation with you. Yeah, as I, uh, Kathleen already said, I'm the founder of Open Knowledge Maps. I'm also involved in GoFair. Uh, I'm part of the executive board and I'm the coordinator of the um, Discovery Implementation Network. I'm also involved in the Open Science Network Austria. But today uh, it's going to be mostly about open knowledge maps. And I'd also like to point out that this presentation was co-created with uh, fellow open knowledge maps board member, Maxi Schramm. So I'd like to start my talk in West Africa. And in West Africa, we saw between 2014 and 2016, the worst outbreak of Ebola in human history. It caused uh, the lives of more than 11,000 people in three of the poorest countries of the world, Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia. And one of the most troubling facts about this outbreak is that it could actually have been prevented and it could have been prevented using public scientific knowledge. Because one of the biggest problems back in 2014 was that the public health officials in the affected countries and around the world assumed that uh, Ebola was not endemic to West Africa, so that it doesn't occur there. And that's why it took so long to put countermeasures into place uh, for them to take effect. And that's why so many people died. But as the New York Times found out already in 2015, yes, we were warned about Ebola and we were warned about Ebola in research papers. The authors of this article, they went through the literature and they found, for example, this statement. The results seem to indicate that Liberia has to be included in the Ebola virus endemic zone. And that caused a lot of dismay with the authors of the article, not because of the content of the statement, but when it was published. In 1982, so more than 30 years before the catastrophe and ample time to put countermeasures into place. And this was not the only paper that they found. They found several papers throughout history that stated the exact same fact. And I should point out that this is not a problem of accessibility because the affected countries, they have access to these research papers through special programs such as Research for Life. And the large international bodies um, who had the same misconception, like the World Health Organization or Institut Pasteur, they definitely have subscriptions to the relevant journals. So this is not a problem of accessibility. This is a crisis of discoverability. And the authors of this article agree, and they close with an adage, a saying from public health, the road to inaction is paved with research papers. And so I think we all feel a little bit like this poor person here. We're just swamped with the literature. Three million articles are published each year, conservatively estimated. And that makes it really hard to get an overview of a scientific field. And once you have it, to then keep it. And this is also corroborated by the facts. We have a high unsightedness of publications between 12 and 82%, depending on the field. This gets worse when we get to research data. So this is a piece of research that I was also involved in. And we found that up to 85% of data sets are never cited. And where it gets really bleak is the transfer to practice. Because in a, even in an application-oriented discipline such as medicine, only a small amount of research is ever transferred to clinical practice. And if so, with a consider considerable delay. So we can conclude there is a discoverability crisis and it negatively impacts the effectiveness and efficiency of science and its transfer to practice. It also negates some of the effects that we were hoping for with open science with increased accessibility to research. And in the worst case, as we saw, it can also cost human lives. 
And one of the reasons of why we have a discoverability crisis is the tools that we're using for discovery. Because search engines still reign supreme and Google Scholar is king among them. But how do you actually get an overview of a scientific field using Google Scholar? Well, what most people do is that they turn to the interface, they type in the field of choice, in this case, education and technology, and then they get hundreds of thousands, if not millions of results. And since you cannot read 2.5 million publications, you mostly turn to a highly cited overview work, go through this one, go through the references, maybe also look into the cited by in order to get newer references. And with time and patience, you can then build a mental model of the field. That is, you know, the most important topics, the most important publications, the most important authors. The downside of this approach is, of course, that it takes a long time before this mental model emerges, weeks, if not months. And this is time that we don't have when disaster strikes. This is actually time that we never have, unless it's maybe the first year of our PhDs. And if you look at this interface, it hasn't really changed much since 20, uh, 2004 when Google Scholar was first launched. But since then, the literature has doubled twice. So we now have four times as much scientific knowledge as we did back in 2004. And for that, a simple list-based interface with very little context doesn't, um, isn't enough anymore to give you an overview of a scientific field. And this was the starting point for open knowledge maps. So we are a charitable nonprofit organization headquartered in Vienna in Austria, and we're dedicated to dramatically improving the visibility of scientific knowledge. And we won't want to do that for science, but also for all the other stakeholders in society. And our approach is to use knowledge maps for discovery. They have a number of advantages over a list-based interface. As you can see in this example for heart diseases, you can see the main areas at a glance. So in this case, risk factors, types of diseases and prevention. And you have relevant resources um, already attached to each of the areas so you can get immediately started. From the theory to the practice, if you go to our website, openknowledgemaps.org, you can create a knowledge map of your own. And um, at this point, we have integrated two main resources. The first one is PubMed, the big database in the life sciences. And the second one is BASE, the Bielefeld Academic Search Engine, which is a meta aggregator of now more than 150 million scientific documents. You can then type in the field of interest. I took digital education as an example. And what happens next is that we create a knowledge map for you. And as you can see, it looks very simple, uh, very similar to the example. So the bubbles represent the main areas, such as education systems, education policy, digital literacy. And once you've found an area that you're really interested in, such as the one on digital competence um, up here, then you can zoom into it. You can look at the papers that are attached to it and take a look at the metadata down to the um, abstract. And once you've found a paper that you're really interested in, and if it's open access, you can also view it within the same interface. So the advantages that we see is that you can get this bird's eye view of a field. You can identify relevant concepts. So for example, if you didn't know that digital competence was a part of digital education, well, now you do. And sometimes that's the most difficult step in the discovery process. Which words do you actually use to put into the search engine? You can sort the relevant from the irrelevant, always, of course, only pertaining to your information need. So if you're only interested in digital literacy, you can stay within that bubble and then branch out only later. And Open Knowledge Maps is an interface over all scientific knowledge, open and closed. But we will always make it very easy to get to the open content and we offer additional services for it. For example, we have integrated the annotation service hypothesis for all open access papers. With this approach, we've become the largest visual search engine for research in the world. 
In the first two and a half years, we had more than half a million visits on the website, more than 100,000 maps were created, and we had more than 1,500 participants in our offline workshops and seminars. We want to go the whole way of open science, so all of our services are free and open. This includes our search and discovery services. You've already seen the integrations for BASE and PubMed, but we also have an integration for open air that is the basis for a visual project explorer where you can um, see overviews of the outputs of research projects. We also do a lot of training activities, so up or more than 40 events every year. And all the materials are free and openly available, including two workshops that you can run on your own that introduce um, you know, students, researchers to open knowledge maps and also um, convey other discovery skills along the way. Our software is also um, open source and available on GitHub under the MIT license. And we run community support and engagement programs. The most prominent one is the Enthusiast program, where Open Knowledge Maps ambassadors and power users run workshops in their communities and then report the feedback back to us. And since um, these enthusiasts, they are all around the world, um, and this gives us the ability to include voices that we usually would neglect because we cannot travel, for example, that often to Indonesia, to Benin or to Chile. Um, but with the enthusiasts, we can also integrate that feedback into our roadmap. When I say we, I mean a core team of dedicated, mostly volunteers. We're also very happy to have an organizational member in the No Center and a first supporting member in the Ludwig Boltzmann Gesellschaft. We also found many advisors from the open science and open knowledge world um, that guide us in the development of the organization and the tool. And many of them you will certainly know, like Natalia Manura, the managing director of Open Air, Klaus Dochtermann, the um, director of ZPW, the Leibniz Information Center for Economics, or Bertil Dorch, who is the uh, director of the uh, University Library of Southern Denmark. We also part of many networks because we see ourselves as a building block of the open infrastructure. And with that, we also want to shape this um, ecosystem and this infrastructure. So we're part of the Open Science Network Austria, the Leibniz Research Alliance, Open Science, GoFair, and also the Joint Roadmap for Open Science Tours, um, where also our research and Spark are a member. Yeah, we've always had a very strong partnership with libraries. As you can see, um, librarians are among our most important advisors and partners. We also aim to increase the visibility of library and repository content because we include sources that many commercial products do not index. So we use the full breadth of base. Uh, we only require an abstract, but other than that, we don't um, restrict the number of languages or the number of output types. So through Open Knowledge Maps, you can ex access all the 21 output types that base in the, in the indexes, for example. And we also collaborate with libraries to develop innovative open source projects. The moment, for example, we're working together with the Library of the Austrian Academy of Sciences to create a discovery interface for their early proceedings. And together we create something um, that I would call the open discovery infrastructure. Heather already talked a lot about this. This is maybe a little bit of a different view on it um, because I want to just um, highlight how important reuse is in this infrastructure. In the beginning, we have the institutions, researchers and publishers, and they now contribute to libraries, archives, repositories and aggregators. So on the right hand side, you can see a few examples, but there are hundreds of thousands um, out there of them, probably tens of thousands. Um, and uh, probably also your institution, your repository already um, could be uh, listed there because the only thing that you need to be a part of the open discovery infrastructure is an open data interface at the end of your repository. At 
that, that is then used by the meta aggregators such as OpenAir, Core, Base, or Wikidata. Um, and they create now massive indices of that scientific knowledge. And again, they have an open data interface and that is then used by the value added services. So I've talked about open knowledge maps. We also have unpaywall and uh, open access button on this car. But there are many others out there such as Orchid or Scoria who build on top of this infrastructure. And all of this creates a cycle of continuous innovation because suddenly we can build all on top of each other. As Heather said, for Google, for example, we cannot reuse the data. And so for a long time, no one could really create a new and exciting interface for discovery because we just had to have the data first. But now this infrastructure is really coming into its own and it's going to enable many interesting and exciting innovations over the next few years. So the one, uh, the image that I just showed you, that was um, the infrastructure mostly for publications. But as we saw, research data also needs our um, needs needs our focus. So we started the GoFair implementation network for data discovery. And as you can see, many of the champions of fair, fair and open data are already with us on this. But one thing that we noticed in when we looked closer at the open discovery infrastructure is that it is seriously underfunded. Uh, many of the tools uh, have maybe one or one and a half full-time equivalents and that is really not enough to um, build a sustainable platform. And that's a big problem because um, the big giants, they already uh, have woken up to the discovery challenge. They noticed that this is going to be something uh, very important going forward. And so Google, Springer Nature and Elsevier, they're also building a lot of discovery services and they're offering them to universities for use. But the problem is that they don't subscribe to the open infrastructure standards. So they don't have um, open data, for example. They do not have open source, so they're not community owned and they don't offer any sort of governance over their services. So they're not community driven. And in the end, these one-stop shop turnkey solutions, they will um, just lock in the institutions into a new sort of universe that probably will be a pale uh, in, in terms of how we're locked in into the publications at the moment. So I think it's important that we make the open infrastructure sustainable. There is just uh, no other way, I think. Uh, we cannot rely on these um, big um, companies to guide us out of the discovery crisis. They're the reason or one of the reasons we're in this crisis after all. But how do you actually uh, make an infrastructure sustainable that gives everything away for free? As you can uh, imagine, we thought long and hard about this at Open Knowledge Maps. And for us, a membership-based funding model is the way forward. And in this model, organizations become supporting members of Open Knowledge Maps and they provide a yearly contribution. And in return, we invite our members to co-create the platform with us. So you become part of the board of supporters and you're then directly involved in the decision-making process of what features and sources are implemented on open knowledge maps. At the moment, we have three membership categories depending on the number of seats that you get on the board of supporters. And if you ask yourself, how did we come up with uh, the membership fees? Um, it's actually very simple. If we have 100 members at, in the first category, then we can maintain the platform and it will be avail available for um, use now and in the future. If we have 100 members in the sustaining member category, then we can not only maintain the platform, but we can also um, develop uh, new features uh, for it. And by that, I mean substantial new features. And if you're in the third category and we have 100 members in this category, we can actually realize our vision. And our vision is to turn discovery in a into a collaborative process. Because right now, this is something that we all do on our own. Basically, us it's us and the search engine. But what would happen if we could all 
build on top of our discoveries. For this, we have created a short video that I would like to show you right now. Sarah is a first year PhD student in biomedicine, starting her thesis on the Zika virus. Open Knowledge Maps has automatically created a map on the Zika virus for her. Sarah identifies a number of articles that warrant their own area. So she goes into edit mode. She adds a new area and drags the papers she found into the newly created bubble. She adds a title and places the area on the map. Sarah is interrupted by a message from a supervisor, Lauren. Lauren suggests a presentation related to the Zika virus that she's added to their joint Zotero group. Sarah connects OK Maps to her Zotero account and imports the presentation into her map. OK Maps automatically places the new content on the map. Sarah publishes and tweets the link of her map for other users to explore and modify on OK Maps. The next day, she fires up her email to see that fellow PhD student Amar has added several papers to her map. She also notices that Tom, who's working on a map on Aedes, has included her map as a submap of his. Yes, so as I said earlier, we're a community-driven initiative and for that your support really matters. So we're really interested in your feedback on Open Knowledge Maps. If you find Open Knowledge Maps useful, please introduce it to your researchers, students and colleagues. And yeah, consider becoming a supporting member. We are seeing at the moment a lot of movement there. We're very happy about this and uh, we will soon uh, present four new members uh, for new supporting members to Open Knowledge Maps. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And um, if you have any questions or comments, um, I'll be happy to answer them. Awesome. Thanks so much, Peter. Um, really interesting to see what you're doing. And, and also, I think the point you make about funding for these kind of services is, is really important. And uh, it's a particular issue with me because um, we're spending so much on subscriptions, uh, the library community kind of collectively. And, and I think we need a really good strategy for starting to move some of that money away from subscriptions towards these kind of services, open services. Um, so thanks again, and uh, we'll have again questions and answers at the end of the three presentations. And our next presenter is, is Joe MacArthur, who's the co-founder and director of the Open Access Button. And he's also going to talk about a new project um, about how we can uh, find automated ways to deposit content into repositories. So thanks, Joe, please go ahead. Awesome, thanks so much, Kathleen. Um, hi everyone and thanks so much to Core for the invite and for everyone uh, for listening as well. Um, as Kathleen's already said, I'm, I'm Joe and you'll get a pretty good idea of who I am over the next sort of 15 minutes or so and uh, so, so I'll just kind of kick off straight away. Um, you know, at the Open Access button at the moment, you know, and also on this call we're kind of shifting from talking about, you know, how can we make deposit um, as easy as discovery. You know, Heather and on paywall have done an incredible job of of making discovery of open access content a lot lot easier and i think we've already seen how peter's work is really rethinking the whole discovery process in general and i think one thing that we've learned as a group who've done a lot of discovery work over the years um is that there's actually a lot in common in terms of the systems you use and the thinking you have uh, uh about deposit and discovery so i think it's great to kind of close up and talk about about this question a bit so um so the open access button um, we build powerfully simple tools that deliver articles and also fill repositories. And there's a real kind of, uh, Peter showed that sort of, uh, uh, the, the arrow going around. It's sort of, it really can be a circle. And that's one thing that our, our work really tries to get across. All of our tools are built hand in hand with libraries, essentially day to day. Um, and they're all nonprofit, community owned and open source, which is a fantastic thing to be running through this whole, uh, this, this whole webcast so far. Um, and yeah, you know, an example of one that we built recently to deliver articles is called Instant ILL. You know, to build that, 
was the result of years of work, uh, really hand in hand with librarians, especially folks in the interlibrary loan community who one is familiar with open access, one is familiar with the fantastic content and work that has been done in the repository world uh, that, that made content available to those systems and to folks working in that space. Um, and so we built a tool essentially called Instant ILL that could deliver every paper for a library with or without a subscription, um, uh, essentially instantly. But for all users, it would be free, fast, and legal. And essentially, we did that by having one box that got integrated with interlibrary loan tools, uh, uh, whatever, whatever subscriptions you did have, of course, open access stuff, things from on paywall, things from, from lots of different repository aggregators through the open access buttons prior work, and soon things like purchase on demand as well. And what this gives is a, a library is one really simple tool that you can use to deliver anything it, it, it can access and lots of things it can't do into library loan while also making that simple for users um, and cutting the cost of doing that for the library as well. Um, but that's sort of the most recent tool we released. It's literally in, in beta now, it's going out to lots of people, uh, which is very exciting for us. But many of you may know us from kind of our earlier work. Um, and the tool that really gives our organization its name, which is the Open Access Button. You know, five or six years ago, I was a frustrated student, um, really uh, wanting to find a way to get around paywalls. Um, and the result of that was the Open Access Button, which was an early attempt to, you know, put together browser plugins where if you hit a paywall, um, uh, uh, you, you could be taken immediately to an Open Access version. And, we made websites that could do this. There's integrations with library systems and things like that. But really, on paywall have really cracked it, which is fantastic. We literally couldn't be happier <laughs> because that is what we set out really to do initially. Um, so, so, but, but, I'm, yeah. So, so that's really kind of you know what many of you may may know us from. But I'm not really going to speak about that at all today. What I'm going to start to transition to is the the answering the question that we get a lot. Um, at the open access button is, which is, you know, what do we do when papers um, aren't available? You know, back in the day, there were lots of times when you would click the open access button and there wouldn't be an openly available copy uh, for what you want, right? And then users would say, well, now. And our answer to that was that we would work with authors to self-archive their work. We worked with thousands of authors in this process. And what we would do is we would take, uh, when folks hit a paywall, we would ask them, why do, they, why do you want to access uh, this research? And they, they'd often give us really in-depth stories as to, and reasons as to why. Um, and then we'd go track down the author, uh, share this story with them, and, uh, and, and then work with them not just to kind of attach a PDF to an email and, and solve this one person's problem, but really to self-archive their work, really essentially do mediated deposit uh, for them. You know, walk them through why they should share, what what version they can share, and then actually, you know, taking the file and putting it in a repository somewhere. And when we started doing this a few years ago, what we quickly learned was that doing deposit well was really, really hard. Um, and you know, for a long time, uh, you know, we were kind of focused on this, and 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 what we didn't realize was that. You know, it wasn't hard just for us. This was hard, uh, you know, for, for, for everyone, essentially. You know, this was in some ways a problem that was, 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 was hard for everyone doing self-archiving. Um, and for us, we think that sharing, just like getting access to papers, should be really simple. Um, and, and more importantly, you know, your lives should be simple. Um, you know, Heather, I think, made the point really well that lots of tools like your know, access button, like um, open knowledge maps, like on pay will really rely on the day-to-day -day work that is done every day, helping authors to self-archive, putting together repositories, maintaining them over time. Um, and, and one thing that we've, we've always been incredibly grateful for that, and maybe, maybe this project is, uh, what I'm going to talk about next is an attempt to sort of you know, pay it back, so to speak. But really, you know, to more seriously create a harmonious cycle between you know, open access papers being being visible on Web of Scholar, being visible on, on lots of places that scholars uh, now now are, um, and making sure that, you know, when folks get the, the itch to see their papers there, they can get them there really easily. Um, and really, you know, in that process, increase the amount of, of, um, of content that is, is 
self-archive that is open access and that is freely available to everyone, right? We want to do that, you know, we really need to transform the process and perception of self-archiving. Self-archiving has a well-earned reputation of being pretty difficult for authors. Um, and, uh, uh, and, so, and so we want it, we want it to be simple and, and not just for us, but, but really for everyone. And to help do that, um, the tool that we're putting together is called um, shareyourpaper.org. And with shareyourpaper.org, we want to bring a, a deposit workflow that is simple as clicking a link, dragging and dropping your paper, and then being done and being able to get on with your day. We want to bring uh, a workflow like that to, to not just our own tools, but to, to, to everyone. We do that by automating metadata entries. So there are no forms. By doing permissions checking on the fly so people know exactly what version they can share without needing a, 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 a degree in copyright. Um, and also checking the, what versions of articles are, are shared so that we know immediately whether or not something can be archived or whether we need to give someone a friendly nudge to say, actually, you, you, know, you, need, to, you need to be giving us something different. And then Share Your Paper is also about beautifully explaining um, you know, the only step left for uploaders, which is actually uploading the paper itself. You know? Why do they need to do that? what version they're looking for and how do they find it. Um, I'm going to kind of walk you through exactly what this all looks like in just a moment. But our goal really is to make a workflow like that, to make a tooling like that available to any library with any, uh, with any repository is an embeddable tool. So it can be on your website. We want it to need no complex integrations or migrations for your repository because no one wants to migrate a repository. It's very difficult. <laughs> and, and integrations are difficult to maintain for us and also for you. So we want to make this tool available to everyone. We want it available as an API if you don't like our particular inter interface or you really want to integrate this into some, in, in some way that we haven't thought about yet. And obviously, we'll, we'll make this workflow available at shareyourpaper.org as well so that anyone in the world can make, deposit their, their research this easily. They don't need to be tied. Um, to an institution. So what does all of this look like? What does click, drag and drop, and then being done actually look like? Well, before I show you that, I have to introduce you to Layla. Layla is the um, scholarly communications librarian at Montana State University, and they partner with us to bring Share Your Paper uh, uh, to life in the first version of it, really to into the hands of, of everyone. And we work pretty much daily with Layla. She's gotten five emails from me just today, uh, probably. And uh, we'll get another five tomorrow. Um, and and she's, we're really excited to work with her in Montana State because they've shared our observation, really of thinking, what have we learned as a community from Mediated Deposit? And how can we turn that into a simple tool for scholars um, and, and depositors, not sort of a dozen workarounds? Um, and how do we make self-archiving not just the, the right thing, but the easy thing as well? So Layla, uh, every, every week or so, sends an email to our scholars congratulating them on, on whatever they've published. Um, and this is just a gift that's just going to play. I'm going to talk over it quite a few times. So Layla sends us an email, which we think is fantastic. And, and with Share Your Paper, what she's able to put in this email is a direct link to, to upload, um, uh, upload the paper in question, essentially. Right? So you'll see that in, in just a second. It's on... The, it's on her ScholarWorks domain, and it links exactly to the paper that um, the, 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 the author is wanting to deposit. When they get there, what they see is a really friendly page that walks them through why they should deposit something, what version they need to find, how they can check they got it right, what we're going to do, and they can just upload the file. I'm not quite showing you that here, so we're just pretending that you just click it. Uh, and then when you hit upload, essentially, if they get it right, they get an instantly uh, available link. Um, where they can then, that will then, because of the great work of, of um, Paywall, again, that will turn up on Web of Science and all of those other places. <laughs> um, but they can also take that link, put it on their CV, they can put it on their website, they can, you know, use this to think about what they should put in ResearchGate even. Um, but essentially, they know there and then they're done. And our favorite part of this is they're invited to do, to do another upload, right? And if it's this quick, we hope that people will do quite a few and we'll build interfaces to help them do that as well. Um, so there's a few parts of this I just want to draw your attention to. The first link, thing is that link in the email. It's a direct link um, that will be available on, on anyone's domain when you're using shareyourpaper.org. So this, can, this, is, this is on your website. And that's really important to us. This is, you know, they call them institutional repositories for a reason. And one thing we've seen in user testing is how important the connection to the library is. So, so shareyourpaper goes on your website 
It looks just like you made it, essentially. It's got, it's got your brand, your fonts, your colors, everything. Um, and it's, it, it's on your website. People aren't going off to some weird open access button website. No one knows about that, us, you know? Um, they, they're sticking with you. Um, the second thing that really excites us is, yeah, again, that kind of instant uh, availability. Um, and you know what? There's more to say here. You know, one thing I just want to draw your attention to is the simplicity of the copy. We get in user testing, folks tell us again and again that they're really excited by just how, how much sense this makes to them. And we, you know, we, we've struggled for years to explain, you know, what versions to find and why to folks, but this seems to crack it. But if it doesn't, one thing that we've got is, you know, little help arrows all over the place. If folks want more information, it's there for them. Um, and then, yeah, that instant availability is really important as well. So I'm sure a lot of you are thinking, you know, even with all of this beautiful copy and this nice interface, you know, people are still going to get it wrong. And we, we, we know that. Uh, so one thing that was really important for us was, you know, when they do get it wrong, how do we do that? And this is where the version checking that Show Your Paper does is, is really, really important. We're checking immediately when they upload um, what version of, of, of this paper has been has been given if it's a publisher pdf we can immediately say hey this is a publisher pdf and you can't share that for this reason you know here you can try again or or if for some reason we've, we've got it wrong they can let us know that too um and this is you know just a friendly nudge while people are in the moment and about about how to get it right but it also means of course that the the um we're trying to save repository managers lots and lots of time by not having to sift through lots of versions that um that, that, that can't be deposited. Um, you know, whatever you get through this tool, you know it can go in your repository. You know, if you don't have a link uh, and authors are just coming to submit, they can do that too. They can put in a DOI and eventually they're able to do article titles and things like that, just on the rest of our tools. But of course, often scholars can't actually share legally a version of their work, you know, and that's a, that's a, you know, that's a real shame. Um, but we don't want it to be a disappointment when they come to the tool. We want it so that when you, we, what we want is when you come to shareyourpaper.org, uh, you know you can make your work more available, no matter where you publish or whatever you did. And do that with leveraging uh, dark deposit here so that scholars can um, give us consent to basically say, hey, you know, maybe I can't share this with everyone, maybe it can't be available just kind of at the, at the click of a button, but we can at least remove the price tag and make it so that if you just request the work, then, um, uh, then, then you can still get access to it. We think this is a kind of big step in the right direction, and but all of this sort of, sort of stuff is configurable. If you don't want to do dark deposit, that's fine. We'll focus on the next bit that happens here, which is that we're trying to help people understand, you know, what to do next time. If they can't share this time. Where do they need to publish next time? Or could they request access, uh, request permission um, from the uh, from the from the journal for this paper? So there's a, there's a lot going on behind the scenes here. There's lots and lots of technical details going on, but I'll just share a few that come up most often. So the first thing is that papers are being made instantly accessible via Zenodo, and then they're ingested into your repository. But we make that ingestion really, really easy, right? So you, know, you can get deposits you know, sent with metadata and all the permissions information just to your email. We can give you bulk upload spreadsheets that you can just kind of use to put into your, um, uh, into your repository, or of course you can do a direct integration against the API for the service um, and eventually we might do direct integrations with repositories as well. But putting into Zenodo means we can make it instantly accessible and give that instant gratification, which is, which is so important for letting authors like, really get satisfaction from doing self-archiving. The other thing is, you know, to put this together, we've had to build a few services that um, that help provide article metadata. And obviously we're leaning on the fantastic prior work of Crossref, of Unpaywall, and of many others in pulling together all of that metadata, organizing it, cleaning it, and, 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 and making it accessible. For the full permissions information, um, to build a service like this, we had to redesign permissions checking from basically the ground up. So while we can use Sherperemia, our first port of call will be a custom service that we put together just for this. It's of course, it's, it's all open, it's free. Um, and you can use it today, but what it does is it, um, it, it, it makes permissions checking something that can be done in a completely machine readable way um, and something that needs no intervention. So, you know, we know what embargo periods are and we can, we can look at them in the data set really cleanly. We can compute deposit statements. So we know that, you know, we know to fill dates where they're needed in, in, in deposit statements and link out to DOIs. Basically it means you don't need to touch 
or know anything about permissions in order to do the deposit correctly. And you don't need to touch anything in terms of permissions and, and, and creating blurbs for, um, for your repository. And then of course, we've got a bunch of stuff being made to check the version when it's, um, when it's being deposited as well. Um, so all of this, we really wanna make sure that this can be set up in about 30 minutes without any coding or technical skills um, uh, and then pilot it in one click. And of course, over time, this is, this is hosted. We're hosting it on your behalf and we'll maintain it as well. So any bugs that are problem. <laughs> um, so I've sort of shared like a little, a little slice of share your paper. There's a lot more here and there's a lot more workflows that, that I haven't shown. And there's a lot more sort of features and things that we're really, really excited about that, that I don't have time to talk about either. But if you go to our website, you'll be able to see um, a bunch of them already. The exciting thing is that this should be coming, at least for Layla, uh, in December. Um, but we reckon that there'll be a broadly available version sometime early next year, maybe as early as January, or for folks who are signed up and really willing to um, uh, you know, dive in early, you know, people may be even able to use it as early as this, as this December. Um, everything you've heard about so far um, is, is free. Uh, it's open source, the, everything is backed by open data and is community controlled. Um, to help sustain the service and make it better, there'll be paid for upgrades um, as well with benefits that help your institution. Um, uh, but, but, but everyone be, will be able to gain the benefits of everything I've said about Share Paper so far for free. Um, and this is, this is really built on tools that you can use today. You know, while working um, with scholars every day, you know, emailing thousands of people, trying to get them to deposit, um, we have built lots of guides, lots of tools, lots of um, lots of things that you can already use. They're all kind of they were all built on the path to share your paper, but it means that they're available now if if you want to get stuck in uh, right away. So the final thing I want to say is just thank you to um, to the Arcadia Fund who really underwrote uh, uh, all of this work. Um, all of the library who's, who've, who've signed up for our paid options already and um, are really leading the way in helping us sustain all of this work and grow it. Um, we couldn't have done this uh, without, without any of these folks. Um, and of course, thank you to, to all the folks over the years who have been doing media deposit, who've been experimenting with different ways of doing deposit. We have really looked at just about everything that we can find on, on this sort of stuff and are trying to bring it together um, uh, in this tool. So I'm sure the slides will be sent around, but if you want them straight away, uh, then you can get them at this, this, this address, openaccessbutton.org for slash call. Um, and if you want updates, more information, early access, anything uh, about Share Your Paper, um, then you can go to shareyourpaper.org for slash libraries, and you can see uh, what we're up to there. There's lots of stuff, and, and if you want way more, you can email me uh, or um, check out our blog as well. There's kind of lots of stuff that we're um, releasing at the moment on this. So. Really, thank you so much for your time. We'd be thrilled to take questions about Share Your Paper or anything that we've built over the years. Um, and uh, yeah, just um, Kathleen, over to you. Thank you so much, Joe. That was really interesting. And, um, you know, maybe giving us a new way of thinking about depositing into repositories, because I think we do acknowledge that a lot of the deposit workflow right now is a little bit difficult for many authors. Um, and and I, I, you know, I think this, these, the three presentations we had today are just really great examples of how you can build value added services on open tools and open content. And that's really what we want to promote. Um, I'm going to invite uh, the participants or the attendees to put questions now into the Q&A box. And if you look at the bottom of the screen, the Zoom screen, there's a Q&A box there. Please go ahead and, and add your questions there and then I will read them out to the presenters. Um, but I think to get us started, I have, I have one question for all of you. Um, because I think one of the challenges for us is, and one of the things that CORE would like to, per, um, to be more active in is ensuring that repositories are able to participate in all of these services in a very active way. So um, I, I'd like to ask you, can you tell me one or two, two or three things that repositories should do that's important for you 
it, to ensure that they're really engaging with your service, like registration or better metadata or whatever uh, you feel are the most important uh, two or three things they should do. And maybe I'll start with Heather and then Peter and Joe. So Heather. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, it's a good question. I think they should check and see uh, if they're in on paywall. Um, yeah, it's a good question. It's a little bit tricky because um, there's lots of things I could say about uh, including things in metadata, like whether it's a published version or a submitted version or accepted version and so on. But one of the things that we are trying to do like Google did and like others try to do is um, do a good job even when repositories don't do that information, right? Because you can't count that limit. If, if you count on everyone having good metadata, um, your service isn't going to be as good as if you are able to make do with the metadata they have. So we're really trying to make do with metadata we've got. So I think that what I would say is check uh, how we're indexing you in on paywall. If there's issues, get in touch uh, and talk with Richard about the best way to fix those. Um, yeah, sorry, I don't have a better a better uh, answer right now. No, I, I think that's a good answer. And uh, one of the things that we have on our, our list of things to do that we'll, we'll kind of ramp up in December is um, a kind of widespread campaign related to improving metadata in repositories. So I think that's important and we'd certainly like to continue to engage with you around the kind of metadata that you feel is really valuable to make your service work. So I'll definitely follow up with you about that, Heather, in the coming, coming weeks. Uh, Peter? Yeah, sure. So I guess the uh, top most uh, frequently asked question is how do we get our content into open knowledge maps? And for that, it's best to check if you're indexed in base. Um, and if not, I think um, it would be highly beneficial to do so um, because uh, then you also get included in all the other cool tools, right? Um, and you make the open infrastructure better as a whole. So that's uh, um, that's the, the, the most frequent question that I get, and it's a very easy one to answer. Um, I'm always very happy and hope that, that they will follow up on that. Um, in terms of getting really involved, I mean, that's why we created the membership-based model. So we're really excited to start this conversation with the repositories on this level of, you know, how can we actually improve um, the visibility of your content? What else do you need from us? What are kind of the, the top features that you need? Is it maybe a drop down where you can select your repository and then create maps just based on the content of your researchers, for example? Do you want an iframe integration on your website, for example, so your researchers can stay um, within your systems, um, such as uh, also done in, in Share Your Paper, for example? So we really want to learn um, and uh, implement <clears throat> the most important features there. And yeah, in terms of metadata, I think um, anything that you can improve also will improve in the end the, um, the, the output. Um, one thing that we've learned in particular is that um, language information is very sparse. And uh, it's something that would be re really helpful in order to improve the service when uh, users can actually restrict, for example, the languages that they want to see to the ones that they're able to speak um, and things like that. Um, so yeah, that, that would be my, my one wish um, in ter terms of metadata, but anything that you can do will, uh, in the end, improve the result. So, I, so in terms of getting your content out there, you know, I would, I, my answer would be the same as, as Heather and Peter's, get stuff in, make sure you're in those, those indexes. That's really important. In terms of things like show your paper, um, you know, I'll just share that essentially everything that all of our self-archiving services were basically co-designed with a library or libraries. So like we'll find a library who's really up for doing something big in self-archiving. And then we just like work day to day with them for a few months until we figure out something really good that should come out the other side that pulls together sort of the best of, of, of the library community's values, knowledge, and kind of combines that with thinking about what everyone else in the world may need and, and sort of a, a product design lens, bring good design developers 
and and uh, you know another perspective into it. So we often produce like lots of early versions uh, like that, and then we'll open them up for other people to feed into. So for example, our permission system, um, we we built that based on a, a permit a, a, a database that Penn um, State had for like ten years. We worked with them to retool it for. Uh, for um, for this new system, and then I think we worked with dozens of libraries to test the results, figure out what was needed, and we just sort of built in response and figured out what would work. We're doing the same thing with Share Your Paper. We're partnered with Montana State, but if you sign up for early access, we'll be sending you early versions saying, what do you think? Uh, figuring out like the big meaty questions in collaboration with the library community, and then building that, essentially. So that's that's essentially what we, uh, uh, what we, what we would say is, is kind of the, if there's something you like, there are lots of routes to get really involved in, in helping make it great. Great, thank you very much. Kathleen? Yes. May I add one thing uh, inspired by something that Peter said? Sure. Thanks. Uh, and on Paywall, we actually, although we started off being based on the base database, we're not actually anymore. And I think it raises an uh, important point uh, for the audience. And that is that, uh, because that it's important to us, our data sources are licensed for commercial use. So we are a nonprofit and a lot of our, um, a lot of our users are nonprofits and it's not commercial, but our sustainability model is a commercial sustainability model. And that means that the things we use need to be uh, licensed for that sort of use. And it's some, I think in, in academia, we can often shun commercial use as being impure or well, or somehow against academic freedom or something like that. But I think it's important to realize it has a real implication when we're building open infrastructure. Um, and what exactly basis terms are I, I, isn't my main point. Uh, but, but yeah, I think it's going to become more and more apparent um, more and more important as we keep building this open infrastructure that uh, licensing that um, restricts commercial use is really, really harmful. Thanks very much for that. It's interesting because there are different, there are definitely different opinions on that. And I know, for example, um, the time I've spent, spent in Latin America, they're um, just generally quite, a, you know, uh, against, um, or certainly they're non, they apply non-commercial uh, license, CC licenses to their content. So I think it's important to be able to make the case to those types of organizations that um, why it is important to open up and, and, and perhaps that they will not be a part of these other value added services that are being built is one of them. Um, so we've got a couple questions here. Um, the first one is for Joe. And I'm going to read it out, okay? Our library offers mediated deposits, so deposits are easy for authors. But the main bottleneck we are encountering is with authors who don't have their postprints and find it too time-consuming to find them. As far as I can see, Share Your Paper is not offering a solution for that at the moment. Is this part of a future plan? For example, suggesting an, um, suggest an existing postprint from another repository from a publisher that makes them available, etc. Yeah, for sure. That, so that's a really good question. Um, so the first thing is really great that you're doing media deposit. Um, you know, this is this is really built to help even if you do uh, media deposit, right? So one thing I should say is, you know, in the presentation I talk about um, uh, I talk about uh, authors doing uploading, but if the library is doing uploading or librarians are doing uploading or or personal assistants or uh, are doing uploading, this this will work just as well for them. So. Um, this is this is meant to help uh, not just authors. The other thing I'll just I'll know is that so, so essentially yes we do have answers to all of these things. It, it sort of goes into some of the um, things that I didn't share, but I will now. Uh, so I really I appreciate the question. Um, so yeah, so authors often don't have uh, uh, the postprints. There's a few ways to take on this this challenge. So the first is you get them when they do, right? So one thing with uh, share paper that I didn't share is that. Um, there will be a, a route for um, sharing your uh, archiving just when your paper has been accepted. Um, so that's actually quite a bit of a simpler route um, for us, but uh, 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 so it's a more, one reason why I don't talk about it. So that's one thing. 
The other thing is that yes, actually, all of the suggestions that you use, we will we will do. So if there's an openly available copy already, um, and we can find that you want it on your archive, then we can pull that in um, as a part of that. And then the other thing is, yes, we will also get it from publisher um, from publisher sites. So a, about a year ago, maybe a bit more, maybe a bit less. I don't, don't quote me. Um, we spent a lot of time working with publisher submission systems um, to figure out. Here, you know, what are the steps that you need as an author to get your AAM out of there? And we found that a lot of those folks would share, would keep archived copies in there for almost five years, like major, major publishers. And for us, this was a real breakthrough for us because, you know, the, one of the problems with finding author accepting manuscripts for authors, why it takes a long time, why they don't want to do it, is basically you're asking them to search for something that they, they don't know what they're searching for and they're not really sure why they should be searching. And so, um, with direct to AM, I put a link in the chat. We managed to make that for most major publishers a, a one, two, three process. You click the link to go to your, your um, uh, publisher submission site, you log in, which turns out to be one of the most complicated parts because folks forget their passwords all the time. Uh, and then, and then uh, you know, there's two clicks and you might have that author accept, author accept your manuscript. You know it's definitely the right one. And, and if you lost it, then it's, then it's there. So there were lots of approaches like that that we've explored and will be integrated into um, uh, like pretty, pretty early next year, we hope, versions of Share Your Paper. So um, as sort of like the leading way to get it. Right now, it may still be there as part of like a help menu. It's like, hey, have you, not, have you lost it? Here's how you might go get it. Um, but uh, it turns out that this is a really good mechanism, but it works best when you can link up, you know, which publisher uses which submission system and give them a link to that submission page. And that's a little bit more uh, complicated than just giving a kind of more or less one size fits all instructions. So uh, I hope folks will be patient with us there, but that's there and you can actually use all those guides right now. Um, so yeah, th yeah, there's lots of other kind of uh, weaker answers to that question, which is, you know, hey, we're gonna try and make self archiving really easy so that folks wanna do it. So hopefully they keep their, their author sending manuscript to hand and they know to share it quickly. Lots of answers like that as well, but they're the really meaty answers is we will do everything you suggest and more. <laughs> so thank you. Great. Um, so I'm looking, I don't think there are any other questions, but I actually have um, a follow-up question for Heather about the unpaywall journals. I've forgotten what the, what you called it. Um, so I guess... Unpaywall journals. Unpaywall journals, yeah. We don't have a so, very big marketing department, so we're trying to leverage our success. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, so I guess my my... My concern about that is that it, it, it incentivizes publishers not to make things open access. If you, if you know what I mean, I mean, I completely understand why you would want to analyze as a library what journals have most of their content openly available. And I think libraries should be doing that kind of thing. But on the other hand, it creates kind of a disincentive <laughs> for journals to allow um, depositing in repositories, for example, because then they might lose their, their subscriptions. So I guess I just wondered what your thoughts were on, on that and, and if there's um, any way of getting around the, those kind of two, pull, two opposite pulls. Yeah, for sure. And I think that those, that issue, um, yeah, so the system is a complicated system, right? They've, we've got mandates going on from funders. We've got institutions making requirements. We've got publishers having certain amounts of data. We've got librarians having other amounts of data. And I think that trying to predict too hard about what is going to cause what is uh, a little bit too simplistic. So I don't think anybody knows what Plan S is going to cause the publishers to do, for example. Similarly, I don't think anybody knows what giving this data is going to make the publishers do. I do know that we should build the world we want to see. And the world we want to see is one where librarians have the same amount of data as publishers. And frankly, everybody's got as much data as possible. That's a better world. So that we're not building a system based on people not knowing how much OA there is so that people can still do OA and nobody cancels because of it. That's not the world we want, right? 
And so the world we want is one where people have got data and then they make decisions based on it. And I think that that may indeed, publishers may, we think they may, realize that they are getting fewer subscriptions based on this new data. And then publishers need to take that into their decision matrix along with the uh, mandates that publishers are making along with whatever cultural change is going on with scholars and decide what the publisher's best interest in. Is it just to clamp down on their green OA policy or is it to actually flip their journal or to go to something uh, uh, different than that? And so, so we think that it's, we are building a system that I think people want and that's one where there's data. Uh, and then we are confident that the people see the advantage of the open access and aren't going to let us go backwards on the open access. Great, thanks. Thanks for your response. I, I, I think in principle, you're, you're absolutely right, but I, I just wanted to hear your perspective on that. So I don't think there are any other questions. I guess you guys just covered everything so well. There are uh, no outstanding issues. Um, and, and with that, I, I, I guess I'd like to say thanks again so much for those great presentations. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to come and, and talk about your services. And again, I hope that we can engage with all of you on a regular basis to make sure that repositories are doing whatever they can to be able to be integrated in all of these great services. So, and um, thanks for all the people who attended the webinar. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Great. Thanks, Kathleen. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. And thank you for all the work you do as well, especially you, Cole. <laughs> so have a good rest of the week, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.